Before he crossed the Atlantic the first time, his name was Akramer Mariku. The second time he crossed, he also went by the name Newport Gardner. What happened in the years between his two fateful voyages and who was Newport Gardner? Find out in this week's episode of Footnoting History. Hi, and welcome to Footnoting History. I'm your host, Kristen, and today we will be looking at the remarkable life of a man who was a musician, an educator, a property and small business owner, a husband and father, a community organizer and religious leader, and one of the few formerly enslaved Africans who recrossed the Atlantic in early 19th century America. His name was Akramer Mariku, or Newport Gardner. At various points in his life, he went by one or both of these names. Before we begin, I would like to take a moment to talk about these two different names and why I will mostly call him Newport Gardner in this episode. On the one hand, Akramer Mariku was the name he was born with sometime in the 1740s, and a name that he remained attached to, at least until he wrote his very last letter, dated January 2nd, 1826. He signed it using both names, quote, Akramer Mariku or Newport Gardner, end quote. And this is how he appears in the first explicit written reference to him in 1789. The next reference in 1792 refers to him only as, quote, Mr. Newport Gardner, end quote. He used his African name occasionally in the written records we have, but more often he used just that second name, Newport Gardner, which was a name imposed upon him by the man who enslaved him, Captain Caleb Gardner of Newport, Rhode Island. It was a name of ownership and place, and it was originally compulsory. We don't really know why he continued to use the name Newport Gardner. He never said, but he did use it, at least in his later public life. And so I will mostly do that here while also remembering that he went by another. This is just one example of the insufficient information we have on the life of Newport Gardner and so many other enslaved peoples of the American colonies and states. Historians know a lot about the institution of slavery, but the very inhumane nature of it means that millions of individual stories have been lost, and historians are left to try to reconstruct circumstances and environments as best they can. Newport Gardner lived much of his life in the American colony and later state of Rhode Island. Rhode Island, and Newport in particular, had a reputation for being kind of liberal and enlightenment -y in the 18th century. Ben Franklin's brother James opened a press in Newport in 1726, when Boston became too intolerable. Artists like Samuel King and Gilbert Stewart had studios in Newport. The Redwood Library in Athenaeum, founded in 1747, remains the oldest community library in the United States. Many Newporters belonged to the Church of England, but there were also Quakers and Jews who lived and practiced openly and freely where they otherwise could not. And that's all great, but a foundational pillar of Rhode Island and the city of Newport's economy was the slave trade. Historian Elaine Foreman Crane says that it's hard to pinpoint when exactly they started, but the first known slaving voyage from Rhode Island was before the colony even had a charter, in 1649 with William Withington's ship, The Beginning, and yes, that was the real, tragically appropriate name. In 1708, Rhode Island recognized perpetual slavery, and by 1723, they were pretty dependent on the slave trade. Crane writes that more ships left Newport for the African coast than any other American port, and Newport-based ships accounted for at least 70% of the trade by 1770. Newport was a bustling, prosperous city, at least until the American Revolution, and that prosperity revolved around molasses, and rum, and slavery. In the latter half of the 18th century, Captain Caleb Gardner was profiting a great deal. He appears as number 29, out of 135, in a list of Newport taxpayers in 1772, making him one of the wealthiest people in the city. This same list, which appears in Crane's book, has Gardner as owning two enslaved people in 1774, one of whom was Shirley Newport Gardner. Newport Gardner was taken to Rhode Island as an enslaved person sometime in the 1760s, quite possibly on the 1764 voyage of the Elizabeth. According to the Transatlantic Slave Trade Database, Caleb Gardner's ship the Elizabeth arrived in Rhode Island from Cape Coast Castle in July of 1764 with 89 enslaved people. 55 days before that, when the ship embarked from the African coast, there had been 120 enslaved people on board. Rhode Island was the first stop. 
Cape Coast Castle in what is today Ghana is listed as the first and only place of slave purchase on this particular trip. The nature of Cape Coast Castle, and many other prison forts like it, was essentially a funneling location for enslaved peoples who were taken in from all over and then sold to ships crossing the Atlantic. But Newport Gardner may have been from that general area. Historian Edward Andrews believes that the name Akramur Mariku belongs to the Akan-speaking peoples of the Gold Coast, which ran approximately from Senegal to the Bight of Benin on the western coast of Africa, which is where Cape Coast Castle is located. Captain Gardner was there several times in the 1760s, but it was his ship the Elizabeth in 1763 and 1764 that sailed directly between Newport and Cape Coast Castle that likely carried the man who, up to that time, called himself only Akramur Mariku. The majority of enslaved peoples transported by Newport ships were destined not for New England or other American colonies, but for the Caribbean. Newport Gardner, however, remained in Rhode Island in the household of Caleb Gardner for reasons we do not entirely know. Much of what we think we know about Newport Gardner's early life comes to us from apocryphal histories of the 19th century, which are not necessarily to be trusted for their complete accuracy. The 19th century stories offer the sideways explanation as to why Newport Gardner remained in Rhode Island that Newport Gardner was special. They tell us that he was an upper-class teenager whose mother entrusted him to the care of a white ship captain for an education, thus making sure audiences knew that he was born a class apart and with an aptitude for education, an education which these stories also imply could not be obtained back in his African home. So that part definitely displays some paternalistic and Eurocentric thinking. But Newport Gardner did display an aptitude for languages. He became fluent in English and French, all while keeping his native African language, which neither these 19th century stories nor Newport Gardner himself ever names. He was without a doubt literate. Aside from his surviving 1826 letter mentioned at the beginning of this episode, he wrote many others. We know he operated as clerk, secretary, and treasurer of the Free African Union Society, and I will explain what that is a little later. In 1807, when the society rebranded itself and opened a school for African-American children the next year, Newport Gardner was its teacher. 19th century stories also make sure to note that Newport Gardner was an accomplished and talented musician. It was apparently Mrs. Caleb Gardner who hired a well-known musician named Andrew Law to teach Newport Gardner music in the 1780s, but it seems that Andrew Law was working with a lot of natural talent. Newport Gardner quickly established a strong musical reputation that survives to this day. While enslaved, he operated a music school for the city's black community, and he continued doing so after his emancipation in 1791. We don't know a lot about his technique or what exactly he taught, but there are a few pieces of music by Newport Gardner that survive. One, called Crooked Shanks, was published in 1803, making Newport Gardner the first known African American to compose music in a Western style. You can follow the link on the Footnoting History website for this episode to hear how it sounded. It's a very buoyant and catchy tune. It's not hard to see why Newport Gardner did well as a musician. While many others in Newport struggled to make ends meet in the post-revolution economy, Mr. Gardner seems to have done pretty okay. Aside from his music career, he also ran a shoeshine business at number four Gardner's Wharf. But uh, please note, per the advertisement he took out in the Newport Mercury newspaper in 1814, he does not work on Sundays. There are a few not necessarily contradictory explanations as to how Newport Gardner obtained his freedom. 19th century Newport Gardner lore has this event occasioned by an incredible stroke of luck. In this dramatic version of what happened, Newport Gardner went in on a lottery ticket with some friends and won. If you're anything like me, you're surprised to hear that lotteries were a thing in early America. They were actually a common thing in 17th century Europe, too, which is how the idea was first imported to the colonies. According to John Russell Bartlett, they stood in as sources of funding when taxation was pretty limited, banks did not exist, and when cash was hard to come by. Lotteries were used by local governments and organizations for buildings and schools, bridges and roads. Sometimes people use them to get out of personal debts, and in one case, someone ran a lottery to pay for a ransom. There were whole firms with names like J. Howard's Fortunate Office and Allen's Truly Lucky Office, devoted to the facilitation of lottery running. Both J. Howard's and Allen's firms were in Rhode Island, which had a particular love of the lottery system. 
Lotteries were run in Rhode Island since at least 1732, when the General Assembly saw it necessary to explicitly prohibit lotteries. Yeah, that prohibition did not take, and in 1744, the Rhode Island Assembly changed its tune. So much so that Rhode Island authorized almost as many lotteries as the other 12 colonies combined, and they kept it up after the American Revolution. Which is where Newport Gardner fits in. According to the May 10th, 1791 edition of the Salem Gazette, quote, number 17221, which drew $2,000 in the semi-annual state lottery, was paid on Friday last by Messrs. Leach and Fostick in Boston. The proprietors were four Africans belonging to Newport, end quote. You will notice that the announcement does not name any of the actual lottery winners. However, the date and the amount match up with other sources. We do know that Newport Gardner was emancipated in 1791, and some 19th century sources mention a lottery winning connection, so this newspaper announcement is probably a reference to it. Samuel Hopkins, the leader of the First Congregational Church, noted early abolitionist and personal friend of Newport Gardner, told the story in some detail. He said Newport Gardner won a lottery with some friends, but that $2,000 split four ways was not enough to buy his and all of his family's freedom. Hopkins said that Mr. Gardner was devastated when he realized this, and so Newport Gardner prayed. He prayed hard. And the next day, Caleb Gardner offered eventual freedom for everyone, except one unnamed child for reasons that are not explained, after a period of two years during which Newport Gardner would live and work with him and pay him, Caleb Gardner, $3 a month. If we want to be generous, Caleb Gardner himself may have grown adverse to personal slave ownership by 1791. This explanation rings a little hollow when you realize that his last recorded slave voyage was in 1806. If he was against personal slave ownership in 1791, it's safe to say it was probably not for moral reasons. Edward Andrews believes that the growing size of Newport Gardner's family may have had something more to do with things. By the early 1790s, Newport Gardner was married to a woman named Lemus, and they had at least eight kids. They would ultimately have several more after that. Captain Gardner's offer may have been more a matter of financial preference. In any event, Samuel Hopkins' story credits Divine Providence with most of the work here, but Newport Gardner himself may have given the credit to God. He was a pretty religious man. One of his last public acts was to help organize the Newport Colored Union Church and Society in 1824, the first church of its kind in Newport. And religion had been a big part of his life for a long time before that. He was active in Newport's first congregational church into the early 1800s and served as the groundskeeper. The first congregational church was where he and Lemus had their first children, twins named Prince and Dinah, baptized in 1781. Newport Gardner likely chose the first congregational because of Samuel Hopkins, who came to the church in 1770. Although at one time a slave owner himself, Hopkins became a vocal abolitionist, and under his direction, the First Congregational Church took a public stand against the institution of slavery. He criticized the city of Newport specifically for being so invested in the slave trade in 1776. Also in 1776, he teamed up with Ezra Stiles, who was the leader of the Second Congregational Church in Newport. Together, Stiles and Hopkins promoted the idea of an evangelical mission to Africa, specifically Guinea. This mission envisioned two freed Africans at its head, and in preparation for this venture, John Kwame and Bristol Yama were sent to Princeton University, making them the first African Americans to be educated at a U.S. college. Both Kwame and Yama lived in Newport and were associates of Newport Gardner. They were, like Mr. Gardner, members of the Free African Union Society, which was a benevolent mutual aid organization. That meant that members provided economic and social support for their communities. Members paid dues that were used to take care of members when they got sick. When members died, the organization took care of their funerals and helped the widows and orphans. They offered apprenticeships to one another's children and lent out books. Occasionally, they also used society dues to purchase lottery tickets to help fill out the treasury. Newport Gardner was officially admitted as a member of the society in August of 1792, but the minutes of one 1789 meeting were already anticipating his membership. It was, quote, voted that Mr. Ockramer Mariku, or Newport Gardner B., is hereby admitted with the privileges of having a voice in the said Union Society, and that whenever he shall be free, he shall be admitted and received into the said Union Society." End quote. 
This is the first explicit written reference mentioned at the beginning of the episode, and it tells us a few things. One, in 1789, Newport Gardner went by two names. Two, he was in contact with the free African community of Newport. And three, he was working on obtaining his freedom long before that legendary 1791 lottery win. Some meetings of the society were held at Newport Gardner's house on Pope Street, which one 1803 property auction ad labeled as, quote, Negro Lane, end quote. Pope Street appears on a 1777 map by Charles Blaskowitz, and it was just on the periphery of the town. We know that Mr. Gardner was a Newport, Rhode Island property owner, but tracking down his precise address has proven to be pretty difficult, and just yet another example of the many we-don't-know holes in African American history. Sources said a few options for Newport Gardner's address. Bert Lippincott of the Newport Historical Society is currently working on a history of African American property owners on Pope Street, and he believes that the plots of land we know Newport Gardner owned in 1825 were actually vacant, and his house, while on Pope Street, was somewhere else. Newport Gardner's actual house may no longer exist, but the street is still the same. It's where he lived before, at about the age of 80, he sailed for Africa. When he was brought to Rhode Island in the 1760s, the institution of slavery was firmly entrenched, but during Newport Gardner's lifetime, European-American sentiment toward it was starting to shift. Samuel Hopkins was definitely not the only European-American living in Newport who actively opposed slavery. Rhode Island was one of the first states to enact an emancipation law in the United States in 1784. But that law was gradual, and it only applied to children of enslaved people born after 1784. Samuel Hopkins described himself as gloomy about the prospects of ever abolishing slavery in its entirety, and when he died in 1803, his pessimism was justified. Slavery would not be outlawed entirely by the state constitution of Rhode Island until 1843. While Newport Gardner lived there, slavery was becoming unfashionable, and there were a lot of vocal opponents to the institution, but it was not enough. Newport Gardner was a realist. He recognized he was living in a place where, no matter what he did, he would never be fully equal, and it was time to go. The Benevolent Society to which he belonged advocated amongst its core principles emigration to Africa. In a 1789 letter to a similar society in Providence, Rhode Island, they referred to themselves as, quote, strangers and outcasts in a strange land, attended with many disadvantages and evils with respect to living, which are like to continue on us and on our children, end quote. The correspondence continues on to choose John Kwame and Bristol Yama to represent them on a mission to Africa. Neither Kwame nor Yama ever got to go. Both died before it could happen. But Newport Gardner did go. In 1825, he sold his plots of land on Pope Street and went to Boston with his 38-year-old son Ahema and his old Pope Street neighbor Salmer Nubia. Both Nubia and Gardner were ordained as deacons in Boston's Park Street Church. Gardner wrote and saw performed an anthem called The Promise, which struck such a chord its lyrics were later reprinted and sold. They were preparing to set sail on the ship The Vine, with a group of other African-American emigrants to the western coast of Africa. The voyage was in part the product of the American Colonization Society, an organization founded in 1816 with the purpose of helping formerly enslaved African-Americans emigrate to Liberia. But it was an extension of Hopkins and Stiles' original vision, and Newport Gardner paid for his own and several others' passages on the vine. Many, including later Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth, would criticize the emigration effort, arguing that obtaining full emancipation and equal rights in the United States should be the more appropriate focus. But that was not Newport Gardner's opinion. It is unclear if he knew or believed that his former home was in the settlement of Liberia, but if he did not, that knowledge did not impact his decision to leave. He set sail on January 3rd, 1826. I would love to be able to tell you that Newport Gardner set up a music school in Liberia where he taught with his son and lived next door to his old neighbor Salmer Nubia, and they all hung out together after church on Sundays. The vine did make it to the western African coast, but its passengers did not survive long. Newspapers that year reported that almost everyone on board died within weeks of landing. Many at the time took the news as an I told you so opportunity in support of their anti-emigration stance. 
Historians assume that a mosquito-borne illness was the cause. But we can't know for certain what happened to Newport Gardner, or where his final resting place is. We can visit the wharf where he had his shoeshine business, walk around in his old neighborhood, listen to his music, and reflect on the incredible legacy and contributions of one Mr. Ockermer Mericou, or Newport Gardner. This has been Footnoting History. If you like the podcast, be sure to visit our website, footnotinghistory.com, where you can find links to further reading suggestions related to this week's episode, as well as a calendar of upcoming podcasts. You can also like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter at History Footnote. Until next time, remember, the best stories are always in the footnotes.